Now the story of the modern network with distributed hosts and the one technology that has no choice but to keep them all together. It's VX Land. Encapsulation. You know that thing where you start with a small piece of information and you glue more onto it, and then some more, and then more? Well, you're going to see plenty of that with VXLAN. And with that in mind, I'd like to welcome you to part two of the VXLAN series. In the last video, we got to see how VXLAN works. We saw that VXLAN creates virtual layer 2 segments called VNIs. VNIs run on top of the layer 3 network. VXLAN uses a special interface called a VTEP. This bridges VNIs to the layer 3 network. When traffic comes in, the VTEP encapsulates the traffic and sends it to a destination VTEP where it is decapsulated. In this video, we're going to look deeper into the process and look at the headers that VXLAN uses. We start with an ordinary Ethernet frame that a host would send. We call this the inner MAC frame. This includes data, MAC address information, and other Ethernet fields. It may also have a VLAN tag included. In our example, traffic will stay within the VNI, so there's no routing required. The host sends the frame to the switch. The switch adds a VXLAN header which contains the VNI. The VTEP now adds several additional headers preserving the inner frame. VXLAN uses UDP for transport. The destination port is 4789 and the source port is random. ECMP, if available, uses a hashing algorithm to decide which link to put the traffic on. The random source port helps this algorithm to utilize the links evenly. An IP header is now added with the address of the destination VTEP. An Ethernet header with a MAC address is added for delivery to the next physical device. As normal, the source and destination MAC addresses change with each device they pass through. When the traffic arrives at the destination VTEP, the headers are removed, leaving the original frame, which can now be delivered to the host. Of all these headers, the VXLAN header is the only one that's a bit different. All the others are well known. Fortunately, it's not difficult to decipher. There are four parts to the VXLAN header. Eight bits are reserved for future use. This is set to zero and ignored by the receiving VTEP. The VNI field is 24 bits long and contains the VXLAN ID. This large address space is what makes it possible to have so many VNIs. Another 24 bits are reserved. As before, this field is ignored by the receiver. At the start of the frame is 8 flag bits. Right now, only bit 3 is used. Bit 3 is the I field, which is set to 1 for a valid VNI. The rest are reserved and ignored. So, there's a lot of unused space in the VXLAN header. It will be very interesting to see how this is used in future. If you have any thoughts on these reserved fields, please share them in the comments. As you can see, adding all these extra headers makes the frame much larger. The extra VXLAN, UDP and IP headers add up to around 50 bytes of overhead. To account for this, you will need to enable jumbo frames everywhere, otherwise you will get fragmentation, which as you know, decreases performance. In the third part of this series, we're going to look at the spineleaf topology that's so commonly used with VXLAN. Before moving on, please take a moment to subscribe, hit the like button and leave me a comment. I'll be waiting for you in part 3.